Well, good afternoon, everyone. For anyone that I haven't met, I'm Chris Doder. I'm on the board of directors for uh, the Myositis Association, and I'm also a hereditary IBM patient. So I'm going to be giving this presentation with Dr. Tom Lloyd uh, up here in the front row, coming from the uh, Johns Hopkins Center. Um, and what we're going to talk about today is uh, genetics and myositis. So the reason that uh, we're giving this presentation is because every single year at these conferences, I get the same questions over and over again from a lot of people that are interested in genetics and uh, myositis and learning more about it. So this, uh, the purpose here is to answer the, uh, the commonly asked questions and give you a lot of information. So I'm just going to turn on the fire hose here, a lot of information over the, uh, the next hour. So um, we're going to explore the genetic aspects of, uh, of myositis and other uh, diseases that uh, relate to it um, and uh, answer the recurring questions about uh, your family connections. Um, so what I'll be talking about, I'll give you my personal story with uh, hereditary IBM. I'll talk about uh, genetic testing and how to go about it as well as dangers of genetic testing that are very important to, uh, to know about. Then uh, Dr. Lloyd will uh, uh, speak about um, the sporadic versus hereditary versus familial versions of diseases and um, gen DNA genetic sequencing, and then he'll present a uh, genetic study that uh, he has been doing. We will do questions at the end, absolutely, and uh, I will not leave here until your questions are answered if we run out of time and, uh, and uh, we have to break up. So I will stay here as long as needed, make sure your questions are answered. Me personally, okay, guys, this is my dad. This is Jeff Doder. So he was diagnosed with IBM in 1993 before we knew really that there were hereditary versus sporadic versions uh, of this. He was 44 years when uh, he was diagnosed. This picture was taken um, about seven years before he died. Um, and um, even at this point, he was completely uh, uh, debilitated. And uh, the only um, uh, ability that he had left really was uh, a kind of move his head from side to side, uh, you see there, but even had lost the ability to uh, lift his arms or uh, uh, grasp a, uh, a glass. That's my oldest daughter there, that's uh, Abigail. He actually passed away in uh, last year um, at age 67, and on his death certificate it listed IBM, which is somewhat significant. Um, so I don't put too much stock in that, but uh, there's a little bit of significance to that. We think that my paternal grandfather, so his father, that he could have been affected. Um, we saw um, ways that he was moving his muscles when he uh, died that were similar to um, the way my uh, father had and the way I'm starting to. When my grandfather died, we did take a uh, sample of his uh, muscles, but that biopsy was improperly uh, stored and uh, frozen. And so by the time the pathologist looked at it, um, he was able to tell there is some sort of myopathy present, but was not able to tell more than that. And so that information is lost forever. We'll never know for sure whether my uh, grandfather had that or not. My family name, Doder, comes from Croatia. I have a Croatian family uh, heritage. And the reason that I mention that is because there are areas of the world and uh, certain heritages that um, are more associated with different types of hereditary IBM than, uh, than others. One are Persian Jews, uh, coming from the, uh, the Persian area. Uh, and another is uh, coming from the Ottoman Empire, and uh, where that um, turned into uh, Southeast Europe and Southwest um, Asia. And so could uh, my family potentially have come from the Ottoman Empire some time back? Potentially, but I don't know. But uh, uh, Croatians actually are not usually associated with hereditary IBM. So um, I took after Dad. We were both uh, Air Force pilots. Um, he eventually uh, went to the airlines. Um, and I personally started noticing my effects um, when I was about age 30 in the, uh, the military. And this all came to a head about in 2010 when I was on a one-year combat uh, deployment and uh, things went real far south. So my story is actually just a different flavor of all of your stories and everything that uh, you have happened. So we all have the story of uh, the tripping, right? And so my uh, biggest, uh, uh, my, the start of my tripping, and this is a kind of cool story, so I was doing uh, pre-deployment uh, combat training, and um, if you can imagine me all dressed up in uh, battle rattle, I've got a Kevlar helmet on, my flak vest, and uh, ready to go. Uh, and uh, we are practicing breaching buildings, entering buildings. 
And uh, so I've got my M4 here in my, uh, in my hand, and I've just got testosterone and adrenaline oozing out of my ears. We're, ah, we're going to do this. So we're breaching the building, and my partner bursts the door open, and I'm the first one to, uh, to enter through the door. And it's just as I do, my toe, my toe catches the lip of the, uh, the door threshold, and pff, I go uh, crashing headfirst onto the floor. My M4 goes flying, and anything else that's not tied to my body, and big yard sale in this, uh, in this building. So it's kind of funny. It was only in training. It was not real life. Um, but um, uh, just a different flavor of probably what, uh, what you have. Okay. Um, I'm sorry? Did you go to training? Oh, yes, this was uh, in training, and then we went on to combat. I mean, yes. Know. Oh, yes. I, I have had seven deployments, and uh, yeah, been there, done that, been around the world, and oh, done, all, done all that. Yeah. Um, so as I've gone through my journey, my stuff, uh, EMG, nerve conduction studies, MRIs, my CK levels, have all been pretty much normal as I've had these tests and been normal, maybe CK levels a little bit elevated. So as I've been talking to doctors, they have been over and over again throughout the years, fully rejectful of, now there's nothing wrong with you. You just need to exercise harder, exercise longer, and put more effort into it. And I was busting my tail doing this and uh, not seeing results. It was not paying off. So when this all came to a head in combat and some genius decided we're gonna start fitness testing in combat and uh, did not go so well for me. So when I came back from, uh, from this, this was all boiling up with administrative stuff in the, uh, in the military. And uh, I said, uh, okay, if we're gonna go down this path and we're gonna actually uh, do testing, I insist that I go to somebody that knows what they're doing with uh, myositis and partially because of what happened with my grandfather. I did not want a bad sample to be taken, bad testing, and things uh, to have, uh, end up incorrect one way or the other. False positives, false uh, negatives. False positives don't really happen. But anyway, so at that time, uh, what I knew about was the Johns Hopkins being uh, leading the myositis center in the world, and I insisted, you guys are going to send me to Johns Hopkins. Thankfully, they did bite off on that, went to Johns Hopkins, and I saw Tom Lloyd. So with that, uh, we started with a clinical visit, uh, he and I. We did the same diagnostic testing, pretty much got the same results, but based on what Tom saw of me, my family history, and well, could something be happening from my, from my dad, um, he did decide to do uh, muscle biopsies. And I was particularly worried about false negatives, so I offered up to him, I said, carve up my body, take samples from everywhere. What I don't want is for that sample to come from a place where it is not manifesting uh, something if I do have the disease and it be a false negative because that would have been disastrous with uh, everything that I had going on with the military. Um, so had the muscle biopsy taken, one from my left tricep and one from my left bicep. Sure enough, did come back positive, did have the, uh, the rim vacuoles and the, uh, the inclusion bodies. And uh, Tom said, okay, let's take your dad slides. So we looked at those from 18 years previously when my dad had his bio biopsy done. And uh, Dr. Lloyd said, you know, sure enough, these are the same. And something that was interesting is they did not show inflammation. And so based on all that information, he said, huh, this really kind of looks weird. Looks like this might be some sort of autosomal dominant disease. Based on that, I recommend that we look at this one particular uh, uh, genetic test. So um, went uh, and uh, did that with the University of California, Irvine. That was a uh, blood test. But in order to get this one simple test done, I fought with insurance for a year and a half to get the test done, and they never did approve it. So in the end, uh, I had to pay for it, along with Dr. Camonas at uh, University of California, Irvine. Screw the... Uh, uh, the insurance, and it did uh, come back positive. Oh, I do need to mention that before we actually had the uh, test done, I did see a, uh, a geneticist. I had a consult with a geneticist, and this was very important. We went through my family history. They discussed with me dangers um, of the uh, uh, test, uh, what I could expect from the test, what I should not expect from the test, and this is a very key point that I'm gonna talk about right later. So with that positive test result, I went through in the military what's called a medical evaluation board, and I was uh, retired from the military because of my disease. Okay, so my disease, what is it? So it is caused by a defect, a mutation in a gene called the velocin-containing protein gene, or VCP gene. Uh, the mutation, yes, I am a mutant. 
Um, and uh, this uh, defect was first discovered by uh, Dr. Virginia Kimonis at the University of California, Irvine. That's why that test was done there. This is Dr. Kimonis, and uh, like I said, she did discover that, uh, that disease. The name of my disease, you can see there's a list of, it's not just one name, there's lots of different names that different people call it. So Dr. Kimonis usually refers to it as BCP disease, but others refer to it as hereditary IBM type 4, we're going to go over the other types. Um, a, one major name for it is inclusion body myopathy with Paget bone disease and frontotemporal dementia, IBM PFD. There are three parts of that of what you just heard. There's the myopathy, there's the Paget bone disease, and then there's the mental front, frontotemporal dementia. So patients with this disease can get one two, or all three of those, and it's not set of what you are going to get. It's like rolling the dice, and uh, uh, you don't know what uh, effects you're going to have from that disease. Would you say those again, those last three, the PFD? Yes, ma'am. Inclusion body myopathy with Paget bone disease and frontotemporal dementia. Oh, and by the way, the, the slides are on the uh, TMA website, and this is being recorded, so um, if you do skip or uh, miss something, just watch it on the, uh, uh, on the, the website after, after we're done. Okay, another uh, name for my disease is familial ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, type 14, also known as pagetoid ALS, also known as multi-system proteinopathy, type one, MSTP type one. So look at that, that is a very diverse set of names for this one uh, disease. The, I have to emphasize the M in any of those stands for myopathy, not myositis. Myositis, myo, muscle, itis, inflammation. Myositis is muscle inflammation. I do not have any muscle inflammation. Technically, I don't have myositis. So if you wanna kick me out of the conference right now because I don't have myositis, so be it. But there are relationships with, um, with myositis and sporadic IBM in particular. So looking at uh, these connections, um, oh, I'll, I'll get to that. So the way my particular disease is manifesting in me. So um, as you can tell, I'm earlier, I'm younger than the, uh, uh, the typical attendee here. I'm currently 43. Like I said, I started noticing symptoms at age 30. That is typical of a uh, hereditary IBM. The average age onset is much younger than uh, the sporadic. I have a very slow progression, as you can see. Right now I'm uh, able to stand and walk without a cane, with a wood, but I, I do often do that. So the way this is manifesting, the number one thing that I'm noticing actually is weakness in my lower back. And I hate it, because first of all, when I walk, it kind of looks like I'm strutting down the street and I'm having to to lean back, but if uh, I were to pick up something from this table here in order to do that, what I typically will do is I'll turn sideways and kind of do this, I'll do kind of a, a squat to the other uh, side. Or if I do do something like um, shaving in the morning over the sink, typically I have to do a stiff arm and hold up my upper body like this while I'm uh, doing whatever. I, I, I'm uh, getting weakness holding my upper body up using those lower back, um, lower back uh, muscles. Um, and then difficulty walking on the incline. So I can actually walk at a pretty good pace, a straight level, but it just as soon as I hit the smallest little bit of incline, it's like the walking through molasses and my speed goes on through the, uh, um, through the floor. Um, I do have uh, some difficulty now in uh, raising my arms. Um, I'm still able to do it, but um, uh, do the, the, the strength leaves uh, very quickly. So if I'm doing something here, what I often have to do is prop up my arm with the other arm as I'm doing this and um, give myself strength that way. Okay, um, I will mention, as I said, there are three parts to the IBM PFD. Me personally, I am only manifesting the M, the myopathy part, the, the muscle wasting. I have very strong bones, so I do not have the Paget's part of IBM PFD, and um, I do not have the uh, frontotemporal dementia, thank God. Um, but, as you can see the, uh, the next little bullet there, um, uh, my disease is considered fatal, whereas uh, sporadic IBM is not. And uh, I'm, I'm sorry if that's difficult for anybody to hear, but that is just, uh, I'll just give it to you straight. Okay, my particular disease is autosomal dominant. Uh, Dr. Lloyd will talk about what that means, but uh, essentially uh, every person in the family has a 50-50 chance of having that disease. 
I have a sister that so far is not manifesting that disease. My dad has a sister that definitely does not have the disease. I have two children, and there's a 50-50 chance for each of them that I have given the disease to them. So ask me how, uh, how that weighs on my conscience and my emotions about that. Okay, so um, talking about uh, the disease that I have, similarities and uh, contrasts with other disease. So sporadic IBM, there, it, it looks very similar. If you go back to uh, the picture of my dad, if all of you uh, saw my dad in person before he died, you would say, oh, looks like you have uh, IBM. Um, it, it looks very similar. But if someone like Dr. Lloyd, that is an expertise, uh, expert in myositis, were to examine my dad, he'd say, no, that really does not look quite like sporadic. Looks like that uh, might be like uh, something else. And uh, similar effects, so the uh, you know, uh, full body muscle degeneration. The biopsy slides also look similar. You still have those rimmed vacuoles, those inclusion bodies, just like sporadic IBM. But like I said, what's missing is the inflammation. Uh, there's earlier age onset, like we talked about, and uh, IBM PFD is considered fatal, whereas uh, sporadic is not. Okay, then um, as you saw in the list of uh, diseases, the names of it, one is the, uh, or two of them are uh, ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. This is a very, very severe disease, and there are similarities, but some, uh, some differences. So um, the typical Lou Gehrig's disease patient is dead, honestly, within five years. It is very, very rapid progression, whereas mine is so much, uh, much slower. Uh, the typical ALS patient loses their ability, sorry, the, their, loses their ability to speak uh, fairly rapidly. That is not something that happens in my disease. And often uh, 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 ALS patients, they have to have a tracheostomy in order to, uh, to breathe in the, uh, the neck. And not something that happens with my disease or yours. So yay, yay for that. Um, my disease might actually be more similar to motor neuron disease, which is actually family diseases of diseases of which ALS is a subset. And uh, Dr. Stephen Hawking had that. So he did not, all, he also did not have the, uh, the typical ALS. As you know, Dr. Hawking lived to be, um, lived for many, many years, d decades after uh, he was diagnosed. Unfortunately, that's the only similarity I have to Dr. Hawking. I did not inherit his, his uh, intelligence. Um, so, if, okay, if I step back here, big picture, and this is just me talking, just Chris Doder. I'm not speaking for TMA here, and I'm not a physician. But if I take a step back, I look at all those names of the disease that I have. I look at the similarities with IBM, so the, uh, the family of myositis uh, diseases over here. And I see the, fam uh, the ALS diseases over here. And my disease is somewhere in the middle. It seems to me like my disease is a bridge between these two large families of, uh, of uh, diseases. Um, so what does that mean? Uh, personally, I am convinced that um, benefits on one side of that house are going to translate through my family of diseases to the other side of the house. And benefits, uh, advancements in ALS research are going to trickle over to us in myositis, potentially through the uh, hereditary IBM. And this is something that I'm mentioning to researchers. Uh, my, my concept, my uh, idea of this, and as I do, they're going, hmm, you know what, you, uh, you might be onto something there. Um, so instead of us just focusing on, oh, I gotta, I gotta, um, I gotta uh, heal polymyositis. I gotta find a cure for poly. Gotta find a cure for poly. If we look um, at the, uh, the the greater diseases, I think we're gonna help everybody in the medical community. All right. So I uh, talked about uh, my path to uh, uh, diagnosis, and I do recommend that uh, other people follow the same path. Um, uh, another question that I get every year at this conference is, okay, so what blood test do I need to do? Just tell me what test and uh, I'll go out and I'll do that. Well, it's not that simple. And uh, for very good reasons, which I'll talk about. So the first thing you need to do is have a clinical visit. And I do have to emphasize with a myositis expert. There are thousands of neurologists and uh, uh, rheumatologists in this country and around the world that are very smart, very well educated and know what they're doing. However, they, because we are a rare uh, disease family, they don't have the experience with our particular diseases. 
Um, and so you walk in, uh, you've experienced this, you walk into a rheumatologist and you have to tell them what IBM is. You have to tell them what polymyositis is. Contrast that with going to some, someone like Dr. Lloyd and often within a couple minutes of sitting down with you in a, whoa, often within a couple minutes of sitting down with you in a clinic, he can say, you know what, I'm having a pretty good idea what I think you might have. Let's start looking down this route uh, to find out uh, what you do have. So Dr. Lloyd has seen so many uh, patients, I don't know, hundreds, thousands of patients, um, that um, uh, he, um, he has seen uh, many people with uh, IBM and different types of IBM, and, and he's uh, able to, uh, to tell the difference. So he's the, uh, there's two primary people in this uh, diagnosis process you need to get hooked up with. The first one is a myositis expert, and that may mean traveling. So my home is Alaska, and for my diagnosis, I had to go to Baltimore and go to Irvine, California, all the way around the country to make this happen. But once you have that diagnosis, then maybe you can go back to your local doctor in uh, Prairie Ridge, South Dakota, and uh, be followed up uh, uh, from there. Okay, so after you have the uh, uh, clinical visit, yes, they, uh, they are gonna do diagnostic testing of some sort. Um, and uh, based on that, they may do a biopsy with you. Then based on everything they see with that, they're gonna point you in a particular direction of whether to uh, pursue um, hereditary genetic testing um, or not. And if you do, they'll point you in the right direction of which test to do. But before you do that test, yes, you do need to sit down with a uh, geneticist. That is the second person that is critical in this step, and you cannot uh, um, jump over that, uh, that step. Then, once you go through the uh, geneticist consult and you decide whether or not to have the test in the end, you get the test done, you get the results, and you, uh, and you find out either yes or no for that particular test that you did, which may be uh, sufficient and it may not. We can't just skip down to the final test and, okay, well, let me just go take a blood test and we're done. And I'm sorry about that. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, dangers of uh, genetic testing. So whenever I do talk to people about genetics, another common question that I get is, well, what's the problem with uh, genetics? It's, I just wanna find out the truth, and the truth is never wrong. And I totally get it, and I, in general, I do subscribe to that way of thinking. There is never anything wrong with the test. However, the uh, genetics is a Pandora's box, and once you open that box, often you cannot control what comes out of that and information may come out of that box that you don't want to know or that can uh, harm you or uh, your, your family. Uh, maybe not harm, but uh, impact, um, uh, positively or negative. You can find out genetic information that you uh, may not want to find. People, no kidding, have found out their parents are not their parents, that they, their child is not their child, that there is something in their family that was a, a, a secret that uh, now the secret's out. And once that information's out, you can't put it back. So yes, we can laugh about it and we can say, oh, that would never happen in my family. And okay, fine. And I will say something that's good about many of these genetic tests is instead of uh, going through the entire G DNA sequencing, it is looking for often just for one particular gene. So the test that I did, did look for just one gene, but it was not just one gene, it was one type of defect in the gene. So the VCP gene has multiple different types of defects. And uh, we looked for the most common type, came back positive for me, but um, it's possible to uh, get a negative in just that one test and where you really have a different type of mutation um, than, uh, than you did not test for. So genetic information does not just belong to you. So even though you're gathering up information, and great, I want to know this, remember that your genes belong to your whole family. And whatever information you're finding out can impact the rest of your family, your brothers and your sisters, certainly your uh, children and, uh, and your parents. And it can uh, change uh, uh, big, uh, big, big uh, life-changing information. Uh, can change the way you live your life. So all of you, whenever you were diagnosed, up to that point, hopefully, you had a relatively free life. You were not encumbered by having uh, myositis. So think about if, go back to when you were 18 years old. And what if somebody had come to you when you were 18 years old and said, Jeff, you are going to have a life-altering major uh, 
life-changing disease at some point in your life. And I can't tell you when it's going to happen. I can't tell you how it's going to happen, but your life is going to change. And then the rest of your life, you have that cloud hanging over your head. That is something that genetic testing can do. So um, geneticists often recommend that you do not get tested until you are actually um, noticing effects of a particular disease. There's a psychosomatic effect of we change the way that we live our lives once we know I've got a, a particular disease. And then the bottom little thing there that uh, geneticists will not test children unless that children needs to be uh, uh, tested um, based on uh, they themselves having a particular um, uh, manifestation of uh, some disease. Okay, so last uh, little part for me, um, dangers of uh, um, genetic testing here. Um, uh, yes, it certainly can have an impact to your insurability and your uh, uh, employment. Those are the two things that people are, are most commonly worried about with uh, uh, genetics. Am I not gonna get hired for this job because I have a genetic marker that I'm going to have this major disease later in my life? Or if I'm in a job, am I not gonna be considered for this promotion up to a managerial level because the managers know that I'm going to be debilitated in a few years and uh, they don't wanna have that in their company? Now the good news is, is the last little bullet here, um, the U.S. Congress did pass an act, the uh, U.S. Genetic Non-Discrimination Act of 2008, and this was signed into law by President Bush, and it does prevent discrimination to those two things, uh, in, in insurability and um, employment, simply based on genetics. But I have to emphasize, this is a new area, right? Even though, okay, we've been talking about the genetics for a few decades now, this is still a new area that we don't know how this is going to be written into law long term. And even if something is handled this way right now, it could be different in the future. And it's uh, kind of like your Privacy Act, putting your social security number on the internet. Once the information is out there, it is too late and you can never, ever, ever get it back. Um, Okay, so I'm going to uh, uh, cut it off there. Uh, Dr. Lloyd is going to present, and then we'll uh, do questions. After. Actually, any questions for me yeah. while he's uh, um, setting up here? Please. Can I just ask, how, how does that impact how you share with your children about Great what, question. what you share? Yes, so the question was, uh, how do I share with my children? That was really difficult. So before um, I did that, my wife and I actually got uh, counseling. Uh, actually from a cancer center at a local hospital that deals with uh, terminal cancer patients and how to tell your children about a major, major medical thing. And they gave us great advice about how to, uh, we, we did that. So um, we, we did get very good counseling about it. We sat down our children and uh, we said, okay, Abby, Anna, you know how Grandpa Jeff is in a uh, permanently in a wheelchair later on in his, uh, his life. We don't know for sure, but most likely that is going to happen to me as well. And my youngest was probably five at the time and she was happy-go-lucky and she didn't quite understand. My oldest was uh, probably uh, 10, 11 at the time. And uh, I might get emotional about this. She, uh, she said something I will never forget. Her response was, I wish you had never told me that. And what, how do you think that hit me and uh, my heart? I mean, that just cut me to the, the core. But the seven stages of grief, and they have gone through that as well as us. And uh, right now, I would say mostly we're all to the point of uh, acceptance, but they have not yet started to really comprehend for themselves, do I have the disease? And that is gonna be the next step that uh, we're gonna have to deal with in my family. Sometime down the road. Yes, yes, so we did talk about that. Okay, over to Dr. Lloyd. Would you like this? Or are you uh, good? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Let's see if uh, I'll give you all my spare change at the same time. <laughs> oh my goodness, this is just not coming out of the pocket. There we go. All right, thank you very much, Chris. That was really. Uh, Really outstanding. We're not done yet. <laughs> We're not done yet. We're gonna have a question and answer at the end. But um, yeah, yeah, you're a a, a uh, hard act to follow. Oh, I don't know about so um, actually, okay.
Thank you. Man. Okay. How's that? Can everyone hear me okay? Perfect. Um, maybe I can see if, if I can get the remote to yeah, work. Absolutely. I, I put it on here. I don't know if it works on Mac. If not, I can just go down. Here. I'll, I'll try it here. Yeah. Well, that's okay. I can. Did you already plug it in? Um, the the little dongle. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, great. I did. Yeah, it's it's not working. Okay. Let's see. It's off. Right now. Uh, that's okay. No. Let's see if I can just. Well, I can sort of answer for you. No, it's working. I just had to. Oh. So there you go. Work? Yep. Perfect. All right. All right. Fantastic. So, um, wow. There's a lot of feedback from that speaker. Yeah. Um, so, so first of all, uh, maybe I can ask, um, how many of you have a actual diagnosis of a, a uh, you know, inherited form of IBM or, or, uh, hereditary IBM? Is that familiar? Yeah, uh, okay, right, yeah. So, um, so, so most of you are, uh, Either you or your loved one has has a diagnosis of sporadic IBM, and, and you're interested in in implications for you know other family members, uh, and and uh, something about uh, the you know you know actual genetics of inclusion body mass size. Familial as well. Right. Okay. So I'm sorry. This is really okay. So. Uh, Excellent. So uh, what I'm going to start off doing is explaining uh, really what the difference is between you know, sporadic, familial, and inherited or uh, hereditary. So usually we'll, uh, when we say sporadic IBM, uh, usually we're talking about a degenerative muscle disease uh, with an age of onset usually after 50, although it's, uh, it's not unheard of to have uh, age of onset um, earlier than that, say 40. Uh, younger than 40 is uh, exceedingly rare. Um, and uh, really the uh, hallmark features, as, as I'm sure all of you know, are, are weakness uh, affecting the quadriceps or knee extensor muscles, uh, as well as, uh, as finger flexor muscles and difficulty gripping. Now, um, and then, in terms of, of establishing a diagnosis, in addition to these uh, you know, clinical features, uh, really still muscle biopsy is uh, uh, essential in confirming a diagnosis because uh, what we see there are, uh, uh, is uh, actual inflammation, um, including inflammatory cells which are actually invading what otherwise appears to be a normal, uh, normal looking muscle fiber. Um, and we also see actual rim vacuoles. Okay, so uh, this, uh, this pattern, so if you, uh, I would argue if you have, if you have this and this, uh, it's almost for sure actually sporadic IBM. If you have, say, uh, you know, this and this, it's almost for sure a sporadic IBM. Now, where it gets really tricky is you can have this, this, and this, and it's not sporadic IBM. It can, in fact, be uh, a completely different muscle disease altogether. It can be an inherited IBM. Uh, it, can, it can even be uh, another muscle disease. Um, and so, uh, really, it's the uh, inflammation, and in particular, the uh, invasion of, of healthy muscle fibers by the uh, immune system, which sort of gives the uh, you know, myositis, as Chris mentioned, its name. So, if you don't see that, it's not inclusion body myositis. Um, okay, so... Uh, Sure. Only one before at the bottom. Which is their, uh, which is their pro protein aggregate? Oh, right, yeah. So um, it, it's really hard to see. Is it the black? So, 
Yeah, the, uh, what our question was, was uh, what do we mean when we say protein aggregates and how do you see it on the muscle biopsies? They are really hard to see uh, in uh, muscle biopsies and usually we have to do special stains or electron microscopy uh, in order to be able to see protein aggregates. The, uh, whereas, whereas rim vacuoles are, are, are what is uh, usually seen under the light microscope. Yeah, these little holes here. And now, in uh, every case of IBM, you're not necessarily going to see uh, inflammation and rim vacuoles on a muscle biopsy. And, uh, and that doesn't mean that it's not IBM. So, um, you know, it's, uh, so, so probably the trickiest cases are those uh, in which you don't see inflammation, and yet it still looks like sporadic IBM. Okay, so uh, one quick word about uh, inheritance. So as, uh, as, as Chris nicely mentioned, so uh, autosomal dominant genetic inheritance, uh, what that means is that, um, so all of us know we have, uh, have 23 pairs of chromosomes, right, 23 and me, and uh, each, each pair of chromosomes, we inherited one from our mom and one from our dad. And so, in an autosomal dominant inherited mutation, um, you uh, inherited, inherited it either from your mom or your dad, or rarely it can just occur, uh, you know, de novo by, uh, you know, by chance. Um, and, and what that means is if you have the mutation, um, you have a, a very high likelihood of, of getting uh, whatever the autosomal dominant inherited disease is. It also means that, uh, that the affected individual has a 50-50 chance of, of passing it on to uh, his uh, sons and daughters. Okay, and this is in contrast with um, autosomal recessive, um, in which um, having only, uh, only one chromosome that has the actual genetic variant is not sufficient for actually causing disease. So uh, in this case, uh, the um, mother and father have uh, a single uh, altered gene and uh, are outlined in red because they are uh, actually carriers of, of this genetic variant. And so um, what that means is that um, your, their, uh, their sons and daughters each have a 50-50 chance of um, inheriting uh, either copy. So if you do the math, you'll see that, uh, that their kids have a one in four chance of inherit inheriting both mutant uh, copies of the gene and, and therefore developing disease. So when you hear uh, autosomal recessive inheritance, uh, really that's what it means. And then uh, each uh, individual then has a, uh, or, or the uh, unaffected have a 50-50 chance of, uh, of, of them being a carrier, okay? And so, uh, and only one in four chance of, of not inheriting the mutation at all. Okay, does that make sense? Autosomal dominant versus uh, recessive. Okay, so now, so when we talk about genetics and IBM, um, the, uh, usually what, uh, what we mean when we say IBM, uh, we're talking about sporadic IBM. Uh, whereas hereditary IBM, as Chris told you about, is really a, uh, a different disease. Um, in contrast, familial IBM, which I'll tell you a little bit more about, is really just, just sporadic IBM, which is present in a family. So multiple family members having what looks like sort of characteristic sporadic IBM. And I'll, I'll show you some examples. Okay, but it's uh, uh, important to um, really emphasize, as Chris did, that hereditary IBM um, we think in most, if not all cases, is very different from sporadic IBM. So, so really the, uh, what's in common 
are the rim vacuoles, these protein in, uh, and protein inclusions, and, uh, and obviously muscle uh, uh, muscle weakness and atrophy. But there's uh, there's very rarely um, inflammation. So um, if you look on on Wikipedia or uh, online in general, there are four sort of known uh, inherited forms of IBM: um, HIBM one, two, three, and four. And they are, are numbered really based on, on the order in which they were uh, identified, um, not based on how common they are. And um, what I'll tell you is I've never seen anyone with uh, HIVM type 1 or type 3. So these, these are ex extraordinarily rare. Um, HIVM 2 uh, is, um, uh, is I mean, it's rare, but of the inherited forms of IBM, it's, it's the most common. It's also known as, uh, as G&E myopathy. So it's uh, inherited in an autosomal recessive fashion. Um, it, uh, it looks clinically very different. So it has a much earlier age of onset. Usually in the teens, it will, it will spare quadriceps. So quadriceps are, are almost never uh, affected. Um, now, uh, in the case of G and E myopathy, there uh, we know exactly what what the underlying cause of disease is, and and there are uh, actually clinical trials for uh, for G and E uh, myopathy. So um, not only is it uh, does it look clinically different, but the cure will likely be uh, quite different from other forms of IBM. Um, IBM PFD, on the other hand, uh, what you heard about from Chris, um, actually what we're learning as we're doing more genetic studies of sporadic IBM is uh, actually there really seems to be a, a significant uh, amount of overlap. Um, and which isn't to say that uh, uh, that individuals with uh, with sporadic IBM are at risk for, for bone disease or frontotemporal dementia, which uh, is definitely not the case. But the uh, underlying features of the muscle disease itself seem quite similar uh, in between sporadic IBM and um, IBM PFD. So then, um, really, really familial IBM, um, we, we have not identified any genes that cause familial IBM. Um, the one possible exception, or you know, could be uh, could be considered BCP, and I'll, I'll I'll tell you a little bit about that. So here's here's actually actually the first uh, uh, description of uh, of of what looks like sporadic IBM in family. So uh, really, it's a, a a uh, beautiful title in this paper, uh, published in 1997, it says it all, an inflammatory familial inclusion body myositis with autoimmune features in a phenotype, meaning the pattern of weakness, identical, identical to sporadic inclusion body myositis. And here's, here's three uh, actual pedigrees uh, where you can see it's not, uh, it, it certainly doesn't appear to be autosomal dominant, right? So you never uh, you never see it passed on from, say, father to son, um, but uh, you know there are at least two, sometimes even three, uh, uh, sometimes even three family members affected. Now, might it be autosomal recessive? It's possible. Uh, might it be uh, also complex genetics? So, meaning meaning more than one gene is involved. Uh, you know, that's certainly possible as well. Uh, might it even be environmental, right? So members of a family uh, have sort of similar exposures, viral, et cetera. So we definitely don't know what, uh, what causes familial IBM, except to say that the uh, occurrence of, of IBM in multiple, of what looks like sporadic IBM in, in multiple family members really, uh, you know, really tells us you know, something about the disease, either uh, either that there are, are shared genetic risk factors and or uh, uh, environmental triggers. 
Now, what, Dr. Lloyd, if I understand yes. uh, what you told me the other day is uh, one possibility is that there could be a genetic disposition in the family that if uh, triggered in the correct way would then cause the, uh, the disease to happen. Exactly. Uh, that's exactly right and, uh, and that's what I was going uh, to get to here. In this particular study, they looked at uh, what's called uh, HLA and all of them had the same exact uh, HLA DR3 allele. So, uh, what is HLA? HLA stands for human leukocyte antigen, and um, what this is, the uh, human, uh, human uh, leukocyte antigen is uh, also called uh, major uh, MHC, major, major histocompatibility compatibility complex, which is, is shown here, and the major uh, histocompatibility compatibility complex is, uh, is present on, uh, in particular, antigen-presenting cells and is, is required for actually activating T cells. So um, all of us have, have uh, slightly different um, alleles or, or variants of uh, MHC uh, molecules. And so um, what's been shown is that if you have this particular uh, HLA-DR3 variant, you have uh, approximately a tenfold increased risk of developing sporadic inclusion body myositis. So it's, uh, it's certainly possible and likely that that is um, one, of the, uh, one of the major genetic risk factors for uh, developing sporadic IBM. And uh, I, I often argue that in my mind, it's, it's really the uh, strongest scientific evidence that um, IBM is, is likely you know, triggered by an autoimmune uh, uh, process. Would you be willing just to say again what you said about the histocompatibility complex? I'm sorry, I thought about the other one. I sort of missed that. Yeah, right, sorry. I, 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 uh, a little bit. You said the same, but tell I, I uh, glossed up over the um, immunology because it, it's quite complicated. Just but. Because Yeah, right. So um, what this complex does is it processes all the individual proteins in your body, and um, it will it will display uh, cleaved uh, little pieces of uh, protein to immune cells. And so normally, any T cells that are uh, autoreactive are uh, eliminated uh, in your thymus uh, as a child, and uh, you don't develop T cells that will actually attack your body. So um, it's well known that in um, autoimmune diseases, there are certain variants of, uh, of these um, MHC molecules which, uh, which make it more likely to develop certain um, autoimmune diseases. Okay, so uh, how are we doing on time, Chris? I wanna make sure to leave time for questions. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so um, over the last uh, really decade, the uh, revolution of, of sequencing technology has um, really, really changed the way that uh, we think about and, and, and diagnose uh, uh, neuromuscular disease. So um, you can see here how uh, expensive it was uh, uh, around 2001. Um, if you're going to, you know, actually sequence a genome, it was uh, around $100 million. Um, this was in 2013, and uh, it, was, it was down to 5,000. Okay, and uh, and nowadays we can even even do it for, uh, you know, under $1,000. So uh, you can see this. It was right around 2007, 2008 that this explosion in genetic testing. Uh, um, occurred, and, and, and this really went, it was driven by a 100-fold you know, drop in cost in sequencing. And so really it's only in the last decade that we've started amassing uh, all this genetic data on you know, thousands of, of individuals, and, and we're starting to learn uh, what it all means. So um, in terms of uh, of, of whole exome sequencing studies that have been done in sporadic IBM, um, 
I'm going to show you just a couple uh, examples here. This is one uh, which was done uh, uh, actually, actually by Chris Weil, who uh, all of you know is on our board. Um, many of his, uh, his IBM patients were uh, actually enrolled here uh, at this meeting. And it was simply a saliva sample uh, which was donated. Um, and then uh, and, and, uh, they performed uh, what's known as next generation sequencing, um, looking for uh, variants in 38 genes which were previously known, uh, known to cause a neuromuscular disease. So either ALS or some other inherited muscle disease. Uh, so, uh, okay, so what did they find? Well, um, in, in one patient that they thought, you know, had been diagnosed with, uh, with typical IBM, had no family history, um, in fact, on the muscle biopsy, had sort of classic endometrial invasion, had uh, a, a mutation in BCP, uh, which had previously been, uh, been known to cause IBM PFD. Okay, so uh, uh, this is, is what I was alluding to um, in terms of, uh, of possible connections. Now, the, uh, where it becomes difficult is uh, he also found uh, actually 27 um, rare variants in several of these genes. And these variants are uh, referred to as VUSs, or variants of uncertain significance. Okay. Uh, and in uh, actually genetic testing, uh, we, they're uh, actually given a different name, uh, VUS, very unhelpful statement, right? So, um, and, and it's, it's actually a huge problem in, in genetic testing. So in particular with uh, what we call whole exome sequencing or, or, or whole genome sequencing. So the, uh, um, only a very small percentage of the variants that you see on sequencing are we able to say, okay, it's, it's likely pathogenic or pathogenic. And, um, and the vast majority were sort of left, you know, I don't know what the significance of this is. So here's an uh, example of a, uh, uh, a patient who was referred to my clinic with uh, a diagnosis of inclusion body myositis. Uh, she was, uh, was 62 years old, had no family history, and had sort of uh, you know, typical story of, of slowly progressive weakness. Um, and uh, on her exam, she had uh, what we often call a limb girdle pattern of weakness, meaning it, uh, it, it, w it wasn't involving her finger flexors, it was mostly her, uh, her arm abductors or deltoid muscles. She also had scapular winging. And then uh, another clue that it probably wasn't sporadic uh, IBM was uh, a markedly elevated CK. So CK is 6,000. So her uh, referring physician had, had diagnosed her on IBM based uh, on a, uh, unfortunately, only a, a single slide of a muscle biopsy um, in which you could see sort of myopathic features and rim vacuoles. Okay, so. Um, I, I uh, told her that uh, I didn't think uh, you know, she had sporadic IBM. And uh, in 2012, you know, it was still relatively early days in, in terms of full exome sequencing. So I, I uh, sent her sample to um, Emory for uh, what they were doing at the time, a neuromuscular disorders panel. And, and this, is, this is what I got back. This is like literally the facts. So you can see, so there are five different genes and, uh, and like 30 uh, variants of uncertain significance, right? And so you might think, okay, well surely you could look at all these variants and figure out like which one, you know, is likely causing her disease, if any. But, uh, you know, here's, here's the report, you know, and uh, I'm not gonna bore you with like going through all this, but uh, at the end of the day, we have all this information, all these variants, and, and we have no idea if, if any of these variants are causing her disease. And, uh, and, and uh, this remains a big problem, although we're, uh, we're, we're getting much better at it because as we sequence more and more, it, uh, it becomes more and more clear which variants are pathogenic and, and which are not.
Okay, so as, as Chris uh, uh, you know, mentioned, the uh, you know, major benefit of, of genetic testing is, is really just uh, you know, having an answer, um, having, uh, in some cases, really disease-specific uh, you know, support groups, clinical trials, uh, and uh, it can be helpful with management and prognosis. Uh, it, it certainly has implications for um, other members of the family. Uh, I've, uh, I've talked about its limitations, and, and, and uh, Chris certainly uh, you know, very eloquently uh, you know, described the risks. Correct. So the yield. Oh yeah. So, so uh, what she's asking is uh, is this statement here: the yield depends on the phenotype, um, meaning that so uh, in, um, in the case of Chris, for example, where I had a very clear uh, autosomal dominant inheritance um, and his muscle biopsy showing uh, uh, inclusion bodies from vacuoles, so uh, uh, um, his phenotype. Uh, made it very likely that he has a uh, inherited form of IBM. Whereas, if the phenotype looks looks like sporadic IBM, and I were to do uh, whole exome sequencing, um, yield of finding something would be extremely low. And the risk, so um, in terms of uh, incidental findings, so uh, this was a huge problem uh, up until um, around 2013, so uh, early on there were uh, what, what uh, you know, people would, uh, would consider you know, genetic libertarians, meaning, you know, meaning the patient has the right to know, uh, and all data, regardless of the significance, ought to be uh, returned to the patients. Um, and, uh, and seeing some of the harm that was coming from that, um, in, uh, in 2013, the uh, ACMG sort of uh, you know, made recommendations. They said, well, uh, you know, we'll give, we'll give options, but um, our recommendations are that if, if you do whole exome sequencing and you look, you look for variants in all the genes, we, uh, we will give you the um, uh, information um, on 60 genes in which uh, there are 20 known diseases that where clinical care is actually affected, okay, or it it has some sort of treatment or or uh, or, or you know management uh, implications, um, whereas uh, all these variants of uncertain significance are filtered out, um, and that's uh, that's usually what's done in sort of clinical exome uh, or genome sequencing. So um, I think I'll, uh, I'll I'll try to speed through this a little bit. Um, one other one other point I want to make is so even if you find a a variant a mutation in a gene that is is known to cause, for example, inclusion body myositis, uh, it's rare to have 100% certainty that you will develop that disease. Okay, so uh, we refer to that as a uh, Actually, penetrance. Okay, so uh, most most genetic diseases are aren't 100% penetrant, meaning you can inherit the variant and never experience any symptoms uh, your entire life. Um, and IBM PFD also has this uh, this this fascinating feature of a variable expressivity, meaning even if you get uh, even if you have the variant and you develop disease, your disease might look very different from another family member with the same disease. And, and that's uh, illustrated in this study where they looked at three families, uh, three families with, with IBM PFD. And you can see here, so red is frontotemporal dementia, um, yellow is, is Parkinson's, uh, green ALS, blue IBM. And uh, so in this family, um, all of them had IBM, but uh, actually two of them had uh, other uh, uh, other diseases as well, and in this family, it was uh, you know really a mixture. Um, so, in in the case of BCP, um, it's uh, 
the sort of expressivity is incredibly variable. And in fact, there are, are quite a few families where, uh, where um, everyone in the family, if they're affected, only develops IBM and they never develop uh, frontotemporal dementia or, uh, or Paget's disease. So I'll, I'll skip this. Um, any of you who are uh, interested in uh, really you know, reading sort of the latest on, uh, on, on what we know about um, IBM genetics, you can uh, email me and I'll uh, email, you, uh, e email you this publication uh, that goes into a lot more detail that we, that we just published. Yes, they will. Um, and that's it. I, I uh, think I should stop and, uh, and we can take any questions. If you all uh, would uh, repeat the questions instead of running with the mic. Uh, okay, yeah, we can do that. One question. Uh, do you consider the histology showing the rim vacuoles as generally 100% positive for SIBM? With this consideration, or so having having rim vacuoles. Uh, so rim vacuoles are common in in many different diseases. So uh, it's it's seen in sporadic as well as inherited IBM, but it's also seen in, in other muscle diseases. So uh, rim vacuoles alone are are not diagnostic. And the other is with the. Uh, okay. Implement, right. To be, to be sporadic. So, so uh, if you have very clear what we call primary inflammation, meaning those inflammatory cells are uh, invading you know, healthy fibers, and you have rim vacuoles uh, in the right clinical setting, it's very likely to be sporadic IBM. Uh, Dr. Lloyd did say previously that uh, he has seen examples where a sporadic IBM patient did not have inflammation. Was that correct? Yes. Okay. Correct. Correct. Yeah. What? Yeah. One issue, uh, in particular, uh, with uh, with with muscle biopsies is is uh, you know, because IBM is it, it's somewhat patchy, meaning uh, you can have one uh, muscle area uh, which is which is affected and another that is not. Uh, you can certainly have you know in an IBM patient you can have a normal muscle biopsy. You can have a muscle biopsy which uh, only shows inflammation. You can have a muscle biopsy which uh, only shows rim vacuoles. So, um, it, a, uh, so really a muscle biopsy is, is most helpful if it shows you, you know, the diagnostic features. It's not helpful if it doesn't show you. And that's why I personally was worried about getting a false negative from uh, my biopsies if it had been taken from a place that did not have the rim vacuoles, but that did not happen. And in, in, in the end, I actually did get uh, a, a positive test. Um, let's go here first, and then we'll go over there. Who owns the genetic information when you uh, <laughs> want to have that test? Um, okay, so the question is, who owns the genetic information once you've done the testing? And you would think that, ah, it's my information, right? Well, not necessarily. So, um, for example, if you do go out there and you do the 23andMe test, that uh, genetic information is held by 23andMe in their repository, and they even do their own... Um, uh, whatever you do, analysis of that and cross comparing with uh, other patients. They will give you the report and they'll tell you that um, and that it is, is held by them. Now, there are laws that go back and forth about what happens after that case. And uh, I will say, and not to scare anyone, but I will say that uh, there have been a few uh, court subpoenas that have uh, come from the court that have reached into that uh, repository without the consent of the patient and taken that genetic information out. And they actually have caught a, uh, a uh, murderer based on um, doing that without the consent of the murderer's family. The murderer himself was not, he did not his to have his genetic information, it was from another family member. So again, like I said, once that information is out there and you open that Pandora's box, you lose the control of what happens with that. You can still control some of it, but uh, not all entirely.
Okay, well, let's go over to the gentleman in the red on the... Okay. Um, Dr. Lloyd, I, I recall something about uh, genetic history and not being able to identify the genetic history in a family with a particular disease. Um, but um, eight of my siblings, um, along with my mother, had been diagnosed with IBM. Um, four of us have symptoms. And in our history, um, we have, um, I think Dr. Christine Castro, who was a fellow uh, at the NIH, started a, a genetic uh, family search. And that's been going on for at least five years. Right. And we've had some feedback, but not most currently about what that means. And we have four siblings and three sons in their 40s who have been tested and who are either likely to or have already have symptoms. Right. So is there any further insights into that? So uh, uh, why don't you and I speak after this? So I'm, uh, uh, I, I'm extremely familiar with, with your family. I've met you know, most of, of, of your sisters. Uh, you have a, a very uh, you know, interesting and unique, unique family, which uh, I think is, 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 is telling us something about the uh, underlying genetics of, of sporadic IBM. I completely agree. Your family may end up being the key to all this in the future. <laughs> okay, uh, the gentleman here in the blue. How many um, um, genes are there that you can test for? And that a genetic test can you take for? Good question. The question was how many uh, different genetic tests can you do? How many genes can you test for, Dr. Boyd? Yeah. So, uh, well, all of us have uh, right around 25 to 30,000 genes. And so if you were to do whole exome sequencing, uh, you, uh, you know, literally you sequence all of your genes. So uh, in terms of the upper limit, it's like 25, 30,000. Now what is commonly done uh, nowadays is uh, uh, actually what's called a, a uh, actual panel, a, a next generation panel. And um, in that case, what you do is you say, okay, uh, I think this patient has a muscle disease. Um, and so I'm only interested in, in looking at those genes that have previously been uh, you know, implicated in, in muscle disease. And so in, uh, in that case, maybe it's limited down to, to say, 70 or, or 80 genes. Uh, but and uh, also there are, uh, are, are, are many different uh, actual companies, and different companies have different panels and different ways of, of, of doing genetic testing. And so, Doctor, how many of those tests do you know of that uh, are specific for uh, myositis or hereditary types of uh, uh, IBM? Right. There, so, uh, actually, there are, are three companies that I'll, I'll use that um, have uh, um, included in their panel uh, all of the um, you know, known inherited IBM uh, uh, genes. Um, and so uh, I normally will, you know, use one of those three companies. Now, I, um, you, know, you know, since I'm, uh, I'm on video here, uh, I don't, I don't want to get any nasty emails from companies, so I won't, <laughs> I won't name them on, uh, on, uh, on, on microphone. Uh, it, uh, also because, you know, um, it, it's really hard, you know, for me, even as an IBM specialist, to really keep up with, you know, which company is, uh, is testing which gene. And uh, exactly like Chris said, I will uh, actually rely on uh, uh, others in our clinic. For example, our our uh, uh, our, our clinical geneticists or 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 uh, genetics uh, or or GC genetics counselor, um, and and they are very familiar with all the different companies, uh, how much uh, each will charge for which panel. So. Uh, I, I would strongly suggest you know any of you interested in, in getting clinical genetic testing to uh, 
to see a, a geneticist or, or, or genetics counselor, uh, someone who is familiar with neuromuscular disease because uh, exactly like you said, depending on which panel and which company, uh, it can uh, result in very different findings and certainly cost. Yes, uh, so we're going to keep going on questions. If anybody would like to leave, you're more than welcome to, but I'm going to stay here until every single question is uh, answered or somebody else comes through that door. So uh, over here with uh, Lawrence, if you want to go next. Um, I've had uh, whole exome sequencing, and I only had one very unhelpful statement. <laughs> Uh, the question is, and I actually don't know whether it was a panel or the complete genome, but would it be helpful to look for DNA repeats? Um, yes. So, uh, actually, we, um, we had, uh, over the last uh, you know, 12 years that I've been you know, seeing IBM patients, uh, we've, been, we've been collecting, uh, uh, actually, DNA. Uh, samples and uh, oftentimes patients will ask okay what have you found what have you found so uh, I've been waiting for the cost of whole genome sequencing and in particular looking for uh, things like repeats uh, 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 I've been waiting for that to be low enough to feasibly actually sequence you know hundreds of samples um, uh, a number of studies now have uh, have looked at you know whole exome sequencing, uh, and and what exome means is is uh, really uh, what we call coding sequence of your genes. Okay, so it's the sequence that is is uh, actually translated into a, a protein, and uh, and we think that is uh, is the major. You know, uh, major contributor to actually most genetic diseases, uh, but there are many diseases where the actual culprit is not in the uh, actual exome, and and uh, the only way to find that is uh, either doing whole genome sequencing or uh, other sort of specialized methods. Okay, next uh, the, the gentleman in the back, please. Why don't I get the question on the microphone for you? My wife has IBM. Onset age 70. Her mother was diagnosed with IBM at 70, but she thinks maybe she had it earlier. Both were diagnosed at the same research hospital, and the uh, biopsies are extremely similar. She is very concerned. She'd like to know. Is it just sporadic and by chance? Is it familiar? She has been told it is not hereditary. Okay. So I'm, I'm curious, your chart showed the familiars as being siblings. Right. Normally it, uh, it's usually siblings or, uh, or, or uh, you know, you know, first degree relatives, like uh, an uncle and a nephew. So if it's a, uh, a, uh, a mother or father and a patient, um, I would, I would want to know, is it an, an autosomal dominantly, uh, you know, inherited disease? And, and well, uh, I mean, I mean, I, I would have to, uh, exactly, you know, do all the, all the things that, uh, you know, we talked about in terms of, uh, of looking at your, your biopsy, your, um, your history, your exam, putting all that together. If it, if indeed it looks classically like sporadic IBM, and it's an autosomal dominant inheritance, then I definitely want to uh, enroll you in our study. Okay, mine kind of goes along with his question. Alan, first of all, was diagnosed with polymyositis yes. after a biopsy. He had a sister that had also polymyositis diagnosed. Um, later on, the treatment was not working, so they did another biopsy, and Dr. Shin J. O. changed his uh, diagnosis to IBM. His mother also had IBM. She was never tested, would never go to the doctor, but we know that's what she had because he's exactly like her. Right. So my question is, 
Has he been misdiagnosed? Do we need to be looking at other diseases that it, this could be that's mimicking IBM? I, yes, I, I uh, think so. I mean, uh, there, it, it's, uh, it can be hard to know for sure whether, uh, whether someone who has a family history of, uh, of muscle disease and a diagnosis of, of IBM in multiple family members, I mean, the, really the only way to know is, uh, you know, uh, actually doing all the things Chris talked about uh, early on. So uh, looking carefully at the muscle biopsies, you know, is, is there inflammation in both cases? Both of his came back with inflammation and the rimmed vacuoles. Okay, right. So, uh, again, I'd, I'd uh, love to enroll you in our study because that's, it, it's very rare. Like, usually when we talk about familial IBM, it's usually not, uh, not passed down from one generation to the next. Okay, are there any other questions? Okay, um, so I am getting the, the signal now to, uh, to cut it off here. So here's okay. what we're going to do. Yeah. Um, uh, please do make sure that you fill out uh, your comments, particularly because this is a new presentation that Dr. Lloyd and I have given. Would you like to see this in future years? Do you think we could improve it? And if so, how? So please do fill out those comment forms. Um, and now, uh, be, just because we're going to wrap up the formal part of this, I'm certainly going to stay, and I would yeah. imagine, yeah, doc, so Dr. and Lloyd and, and I will stay, and we are not going to leave here until every single one of your questions is uh, answered, so please uh, do come up. Thank you so much for coming. Hey, how are you? My mother, Larry Bird, Charles yeah. Fiedelman. Cytosis Association Helping patients become peers Now for the past 25 years So if you have been diagnosed Here's an organization to unite us 8,000 members they can boast For that real strange word that no one's heard It's myositis there's an annual patient conference, which is just second to none, where you'll learn a lot and network, and you'll also have some fun. And their website is updated with a lot of current news, with lots of info and resources, and much more that you can use, like info TMA compiles, and like lists of clinical trials, and lists of research too, you can review, because it's all there for you. So hooray for the group TMA. Myositis Association Helping patients become peers Now for the past 25 years So if you have been diagnosed Here's an organization to unite us A quarter century they can boast They've been the group that's got the scoop on myositis.